Oh, hi, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, uh, for all the information. And I'm really glad to see everybody. So we'll start with the first session. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see some you know, more people are, are joining. This will be very informal. And uh, Leslie, I, I have to say, I, I mentioned the two old, old people had this really creative idea, which is um, instead of uh, uh, hearing his talk, and uh, to be honest, I mean, I already mentioned to people, I heard this talk uh, at least, not this talk, you know, similar at least three times. And every time you make me think of new things. So this would be a really great opportunity to ask questions. If you have watched the video, and if you haven't, of course, you can, uh, you know, maybe you don't learn as much, but I'm sure you can still learn from the discussions. So, um, let me just first just start with the little official thing. Well, I, I should say myself. Okay, so first let, let me just say it's my great honor and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Leslie Lamport from Microsoft Research. And Leslie has uh, done absolutely impressive work in distributed systems. I just, I mean, I can't even enumerate after studying 10 years, there's still many of his papers I haven't read. I always feel really guilty. <laughs> and, but just for the few things I, I know, I was just so impressed. Of course, I, my word says nothing, and he received the, the 2013 Turing Award for his work, introducing really these seminal concepts and key, just so many of the, all the key issues. And, had, and he even received the three Dijkstra's award. I thought those were give, give the best people, best work even once. And each of those are impressive work, including all of my students when I heard the word of Paxos, they were almost like shocked. It, you know, this is who invented Paxos. So, um, but anyway, uh, I, but I do want to say for the purpose of this workshop, uh, well, I should say one more thing, right? Okay, there's something maybe completely unrelated. Of course, he's so well known to a lot of people, nothing to do with should be system for sure latex. All of us depends on probably all of us. I can imagine I've been using since grad students and I still have the manual I bought latex manual when I was first thing learned at <laughs> grad student at Cornell <laughs> and I sometimes lying to my students too to let them see but for the purpose of this workshop I also want to say right not only you know designing algorithm systems he also invented the, the temporal logic of actions okay as a way to express and reason about these algorithms that are so delicate and so really so complex and to be sure they're correct um so anyway um so so now you can sort of imagine right people might not have really come to any of those without really the deep um sort of knowledge of the problems and coming up with solutions so that's what his talk um i will just actually i give just a, a really brief summary of my view of course it's very limited and 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 so on um but I want to say was, right, I think Leslie got all his degree in mathematics, including, of course, a PhD, but he's been working on these really, you know, with these, right, really the best uh, practical companies like Microsoft and, and, and you know, Dexerc and, and so, um, so anyway, right, so things he, he right, tried to teach people look very simple, but they're just so deep. So the talk basically started with a Euclid algorithm. Um, which I teach my kid when she was very young, just, just learned in school what's the greatest common divisor of two numbers, right? That algorithm says you have two numbers, x and y, and uh, you want to find the greatest common divisor. And if x is bigger, you, you say, oh, x is subtracted by the value of y. And if y is bigger, you subtract, subtract by the value of x until they're equal and they're the greatest common divisor. It looks cute, but you know, how do you say this? you know, cutely and uh, why this is correct or, or termination and so on. And of course, this leads, uh, I mean, really just a little example and to show the TLA and particularly use these really hard problems and more companies, especially the harder cloud companies have to use. Anyway, um, sorry for the long introduction. It shouldn't me say these things, but uh, so if people have questions, I can start asking. So, um, should I actually maybe I should what that Leslie did was hey I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to ask questions which is a you know, quiz you know pick a random people and ask you for ask a question by the way I know you know I definitely know a number of people already have questions but uh, uh, it, so, so why don't you ask the question I'm sorry Emily why don't you ask the question that you wrote already oh you want me to ask it <laughs> okay all right I have more but uh, so. <laughs> okay, sorry. So I, I did the right one question for Leslie beforehand. 
Okay, um, because I'm also really interested in algorithm, even though I work officially in programming languages. So, so my question is, if I just want to write an algorithm, right? He's, so I'm sorry, I didn't even introduce the title of his talk, right? Which is, if you are not writing a program, don't use a programming language. <laughs> I actually really not looking at any notes, even though I wrote a lot of them. But so, so my question is, if I just want to write an algorithm, should I not use a programming language? Um, no. As I said, no, and why not? <clears throat> well, the quote that you on the uh, that blurb that you sent out said uh, you quoted Wikipedia as saying it said Algol was the uh, the standard way of writing algorithms, and that's probably well dates back to you know really when I started that there wasn't people didn't really understand the difference between program and an algorithm, and the only way people had for writing algorithms was in programming languages. So you said, why not use Algol? Well, let me give you an example. The bakery algorithm, the first concurrent algorithm that I published, uh, it has a loop in there in which the process goes through all the other processes in order, process one, process two, process three, et cetera. But there doesn't have to go through them in that order. It can go through them in any order. So. And I knew that at the time, but the mindset was so much in terms of programming languages that I had to say, go through them in that order because there was no easy way to do it. And, you know, pretty soon after that, I really learned this very easy way to do it. I basically invented my own, you know, my own language constructs. I had a, uh, well, I would allow variables to have set values. So, Instead of going through one to three, I said there's a set, you know, had a set variable, variable values of variable, the variable's value was a set. And to go through the each iterates of the loop while that set was not empty, I choose a random, an arbitrary element for the set and then execute that one and remove it from the set. Can't do that in a programming language. You, know, you just couldn't do it in algo. And you still can't do it in a programming language. I yeah, use Java, but I can't you know, what is it, 50 years later, I cannot have a variable whose value is a set. Simply can't do it. Now, all these people, I bet everybody here is saying, what do you mean? I can have a set object, right? So I can let value of a variable is a set, but I can't. The value of a variable is not a set. The value of a variable is a pointer to an object, a set object in the heap. And if you, is, is there anybody who does not understand that? I mean, do I have to go and, and explain why, you know, when you think you're setting X to a set, but you're really setting it to an object, X is equal to a pointer. And if you don't believe that, look at the difference between setting X to an integer and then set Y to X, and then you add one to Y, and that doesn't change the value of X. But if I set X to a set object, and I and let y be x, and I put a new element in, this, in y, that element goes into x. It's a completely different. And, uh, and if you don't believe them, think of what would happen if, you did, if your programming language you used didn't have integers, but had integer objects. And you couldn't write, you know, x, the expression x plus one. You'd have to write uh, new, integer uh, uh, of x dot value, all that thing dot plus of uh, new integer value x. Now imagine you were writing a program, you know, you wanted to write a program that manipulated numbers and you had to write it that way. I mean, you go, it's, it's insane. But if I would literally use a programming language to write that, you know, to use sets in my algorithm, that's what I'd have to do. So it'd be insane to do that. Can so I, that's yes. why I don't want to use a programming language to write an algorithm. So what, what you're trying to say, the difference between an algorithm and the program. So what is the difference? Other than if you write in lower level languages, it doesn't have the feature you want at a high level. But if I have a high level programming language, then it is the same, no? Well, it's like, you know, what's, uh, 
there's no formal difference between a program and an algorithm. Okay. So does that mean I should use programming languages to write an algorithm? There's no formal difference between a programming a program and a Turing machine. Anything I can write a pro, in a, a programming language, I can write as a Turing machine. So does that mean I should write my programs as Turing machines? Obviously not. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I can't give you a difference, but if you don't know the difference between a, you don't understand the difference between a program and an algorithm. I mean, not being able to state it precisely, but if you don't have some concept of the difference, then there's something wrong with your education. Yeah, so I actually had just one thing to add, the language is settled. It's so interesting you mentioned that there's two points technically. I mean, I guess you have a lot of points, but somehow I got those two are exactly the things that are in Settle and Python took out. So in Settle, you have a set. You can exactly, so set is not by reference, it's real set, okay? And it's called a, by value. So if you make X equals Y, you actually make a copy. That's the one, yeah. I'm like, I, I haven't looked at Settle in about 30 years or something, so it may have changed. But yeah. when I looked at it, I thought, yeah, that was a nice idea. But, you know, they had sets, but they didn't have all of the mathematics. You couldn't do that with everything. I don't remember exactly what, but there and were that, lots yeah. of things that I wanted to do in algorithms that Settle didn't do. So, yeah, I mean, it was nice, but it, it, it wasn't enough. Uh, I mean, let me give you an example of the things. And this is something that uh, a few years ago, uh, I had a colleague uh, who was writing a paper with somebody and uh, with, with a couple of people, and they had this algorithm that we're going to publish. And the algorithm was published in DISC. And the uh, algorithm had uh, manipulated infinite arrays of sets. And that algorithm had, had as an atomic action, uh, set the value of a variable equal to the union of all the sets in that array, an infinite array of sets. Now, first of all, a, a problem with concurrent algorithms and programming languages is in a concurrent algorithm, the concept of what is an atomic action is paramount. And programming languages don't tell you that. If you actually look at the semantics, uh, the programming lang language like Java you know, X gets X plus Y is, you know, about four atomic actions. Uh, and they have to be done in the right order because otherwise you don't capture the semantics of Java. So imagine, you know, trying to write a program in any kind of thing that looks like a programming language that allows you to take the union of an infinite array of sets as a single atomic action. But that's what they wanted in this algorithm, which is a real algorithm that they were publishing. Why? Because they knew how to implement that operation uh, with ordinary, op you know, to, to implement that operation as if it were atomic. So when they were dealing, so that was a base of uh, and, uh, an operation they assume in their, uh, in their algorithm because everybody knew how to do it. And they didn't want to have to put an implementation of that inside this algorithm they're reasoning about, they wanted to use that as a single atomic action. And, you know, I wrote it in PlusCal, uh, which is, uh, it's like a toy language, except it's sort of like Settle, except it really has every, anything you can write in mathematics, you can write as an expression in, in PlusCal. Uh, and, you know, it was straightforward and wrote a, a uh, a machine checked correctness proof of the algorithm. I couldn't possibly have done if I had to, you know, think of the of that single operation is broken up into a you know a whole bunch of different operations. So how could I mean there was one thing I was confused. How could a real algorithm have a, an infinite array of sets, right? I mean that I'm sure that's your point. And and in atomically, I mean real you know program or real just anything practical. How could be an infinite number of things be done in atomically? Maybe using in, no in the actual implementation of the way it would use it's an unbounded array. Okay. Uh, well, but in fact, it's okay. represented. Unbounded. The okay, easiest sure. way to represent it as an infinite array where you know, all but a finite number are empty sets. 
I see. So actually, the other point I thought, in, I mean, you mentioned this, that's really, really nice. I think I mean, Settle cannot do all those algorithms you want because it didn't have really much um, really sure, concurrency uh, at, at, at all. Uh -huh. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I, I don't want this to be just a discussion between you and me. So I think the best thing to do is if anyone has a question they want to raise, just put it on the chat and say you have a question. And uh, yeah, good, good, Carl, good. Carl, Carl Hewitt has a question. I think he raised his hand. Carl, oh. if you want to go ahead. Yeah. So Annie. Uh, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. And Leslie, thank you for being here. Uh, my question has to do with first order logic and model checking. And first order logic famously allows all these non-standard models, right? For example, we've studied non-standard models of the integers. And the same kind of thing is going to now, it now comes to us in concurrent programming. So if you're doing model checking, is, should we be concerned about these non-standard models and their monsters when we're doing model checking? Or should we not be concerned? Uh, I have a very pragmatic view of that. I say, uh, uh, you know, what I use are basically, you know, Piano's axioms for talking about uh, the integers. And basically, I would say, you can implement that as long as they satisfy uh, Piano's axioms, you can implement inside of your computer any model of the integers you want. And if you happen to you know, implement one of these non-standard model of the integers, well, it'll still work because all I'm assuming is Piano's axioms. Yeah. Now, I'm somehow, I'm not worried about some engineer building a chip that's going to model non-standard <laughs> integers. I'm just concerned about the model checking possibility itself. Uh, Piano's first oh, order no, I model check it. famously allow oh, okay. that you have infinite integers, right? And, you know, and well, that's not what you really want. <laughs> Well, first of all, model checking what we do, I model check that algorithm, you know, the one with had infinite arrays of integers, and, and the very same spec that I, I reasoned about. I proved things about an infinite array, but to model check it, what I did is I simply told the model checker to, imp to replace the set of natural numbers by the numbers from zero to 10, and then model check that. Model checking is not proof. Model checking is checking, catching errors. If you want to be absolutely sure of your algorithm, you know, maybe checking with 10 integers isn't enough. Uh, but engineers have a pretty good sense of how big a model they need to check in order to have confidence in the algorithm. And the fact that, you know, what finiteness is, is is sort of irrelevant practical purposes for model checking the difference between infinity you know, people you build chips uh you know have used tla plus to check designs for uh uh caching uh cache coherence algorithms for memories and the difference between they check it like a memory with uh with three words and the difference between the memory of three words and a memory of a million words is for all practical purposes, the same as the difference between three words and an infinite number of words. You can check a thousand, but engineers know, I mean, they understand the algorithm enough to know that if they've checked it for three, it's very unlikely that it's gonna not work for four. And they build their chips believing that, believing the model checker and people, you know, People do that, build real chips, build real programs based on the confidence they get with model checking very small models. Because that's where engineering comes in. Yeah, so I guess my real question is, should we be using higher order logic instead of first order logic as Dedekind did to start it off even before Piano so that we don't have these monsters in the models? Now, I, I, I fully realize that when you restrict yourself just to finite models and you're just you know, checking a finite number of them. So this really is a theoretical foundational question as opposed to you know, checking finite models you know, over and over again, which I understand the engineering aspects of that. So it really is a theoretical question. And uh, Bob wanted to jump in on this because I think he fundamentally disagrees that uh, I would maintain we need to switch over to higher order logic so we really know what we're talking about. And that's what Dedekind did and what Piano did not do. 
Actually, I think so, uh, the piano induction is not first order because it talks about all uh, well, properties. It, it is, it, it, it is, if you, you can put the, the axiom into first order logic, it's actually an axiom schema, but then it's not what they call categorical, okay? If you do it, if you do the first order schema, you still have these non-standard models with the infinite integers. But if you add induction, it disappears. This model disappears with induction, the only induction with order, recurrence. Right, only with higher order induction as Dedekind did it. If you just have the first order axiom schism, so-called piano arithmetic, you have the non-standard models. Yeah, but if you add induction, you do, they disappear. No, not in first order logic. You have an induction. Let, 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 Leslie, let Leslie answer. Let, let Leslie say something. Yeah. I'm sure Dedekin you know, was a brilliant man, and he had a good reason for wanting to use higher level logic. I have a good reason for not using higher level logic. My reason is that first order logic is simpler, and I want to use the simplest thing that I can, because things that I'm building are complicated. And putting anything complicated in what I use to describe them is just making things harder for the people who build systems. And these questions, you know, they may be important foundational questions, you know, in terms of, you know, what math is all about, but for practical engineers, practical, you know, those are not their concerns. Their concerns is building a system that does what they want it to do. And First order logic works perfectly fine for that. And therefore, whether, you know, whatever other reasons you may have for using higher order logic, they're irrelevant to me. So I'm not saying you shouldn't use higher order logic because I don't know what you want to do with it. I know what I want to do with it. I want to get help engineers build systems that work. And I don't need for second higher order logic and therefore I don't use it. Yeah. Sounds great. There are actually three questions in queue. Uh, Peter and Paul okay. and uh, Bob. Okay, Peter, you're gonna start. So, um, so I saw the video and TLA plus, you do things like X prime is equal to X minus Y. So you have the def, the next state. So this seems to be tailor-made for imperative languages where mutable state is a basic concept. Now you could have a programming language which has a much more simple mathematical semantics based on lambda calculus or a logic programming language. So, and it would have, and it could have an efficient implementation. So we know how to implement these. So wouldn't it uh, be better if whatever mathematics you use, you formulate it in a way that would make the implementation in terms of one of these very nice uh, programming languages be better than always going down to X prime is equal to X minus Y. It seems so low level. Well, uh, first of all, when you have, have these high, these languages, is there a clear notion of what an atomic step is in those languages? Yes, of course. Of course they. they okay, if there's a no, you have a clear notion of what an atomic step is, then, then if you're writing a concurrent algorithm, you have to be thinking in terms of steps. What is the next step? Even lambda calculus, I mean, church oh, means that- I'm, Okay, I don't care how you do it. I don't yeah. care how you do it in terms of your programming language. No, but, but I, I mean, yeah, but, but you I, don't want to start with one of these languages. Maybe you, you're misconstruing, I don't know. So of course, I, th I agree you have to use math and I try to tell the students, but instead of going all the way down to X prime is equal to X minus Y, you go down to a language with a nicer semantics. No, no, you're saying, no, you've got it the opposite way. You're saying, instead of going all the way up to X prime equals X plus one, why don't you not go quite so high? That's not very and high. The answer is, and the answer is, no, it's high. Can you write in your language, take you know, the, the union of an infinite number of uh, sets as a single step in your language you're talking about? I think, I think a prop, if I can, ask a question. I think um, I'm sensitive to Peter's, what I think Peter's point is, um, and it's, it's, not, it's not the assignment, that I, it's not the equality of x and x prime, that's not it. It's the limitation to, a, to the single state sequence. Yep. 
that's the thing that feels restrictive to me. And if, you know, that, that's, I, if you're doing concurrent algorithms, I sort of understand, I, I can see that. But if you're doing regular complex algorithms, how do you handle stacks? How do you do what is natural, quick sort, which is naturally done with. Exactly, uh, let, let me go, I'm glad you asked, I'm sorry. I'm going to take that question that you asked. You said quick sort is a double recursive algorithm. I presume you mean that it calls two copies of itself. Yes. Is that what you mean? That's what I mean. Well, here's a question I give, I used to give to job applicants. And I was at really good labs and we were, you know, interviewing the cream of the cream of the fresh PhDs. And the question I would give is, assume you have given a partition procedure or function, write a non-recursive quicksort. In all the years I've given that, there was only one person who was able to do it in 10 minutes. Everybody tries to compile <laughs> the recursion. Now, if you're thinking about, and what I, uh, unfortunately, I actually looked and I have not given that example. I've given that example of quicksort in talks, but none that's on the web. Uh, so I'll just leave that as a problem write a non-recursive version of quicksort. And when you do, what you'll discover is that uh, the recursive version of the quicksort is a particular implementation of that non-recursive one. That is, you examine the sequence of, of steps that it's doing, and it's a special case of that more general algorithm. But why does nobody, and these are the best graduate students, why did nobody ever think of that? Do you know what the algorithm is? I, I don't know what the yeah, algorithm is. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Okay. okay. I, well, there, me, okay I'll tell you what the algorithm is. Let me, okay, let me tell you. Tony Hoare. Okay. It, it, there is the story of Tony Hoare, who you actually referenced in your talk, um, who Invented I that. understand that was part of his thesis was was doing that in a uh, uh, iterative framework and he said it was a complex algorithm to get his mind around and he was amazed when he saw it as a recursive how simple and trivial it was okay well uh, let me show you how a simpler one example let me show you a simple here's what it is my basic data structure is a set of intervals i'm uh, uh, sorting an array index by say 1 to n and my basic data structure is a variable whose value is a set of intervals, sub-intervals of one to n. What the way, algorithm does, let me, let me just finish the algorithm. The algorithm does is at each step, you take an arbitrary element from that set, you apply the partition function, and if it contains a single element, you throw it away. If it contains more than that, you apply the partition element, and you toss the two elements back into the set, and you do that until that set is empty. Now, why does nobody think of that? Because they do not have concept like set as a basic thing. I mean, set should be as basic to you as numbers. But because people have thinking in terms of programming languages, they don't have that powerful and ex trivially simple concept of a set as much a part of their brain as numbers. Okay, good. No, I, I, I see what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. But by the way, just as another side point, you want sets as fundamental, uh, you know, object, as you just said there, and you said earlier in, in response to Carl, that's second order logic, right? They have a set as a first no, it's not second order object. TLA plus is first order logic. It has all of that stuff. There's nothing second order about it. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, uh, let, let's go. The uh, Paul Ta uh, Taro had a question. Uh, yes. So um, I would, uh, in a way, uh, bring in also the higher level versus the lower level uh, uh, distinction. Uh, you know, uh, infinite sets are not a problem in anything that has lazy evaluation 
or coroutining in Python. You can have a generator for an infinite set. You can mix them. You can uh, uh, do the same thing in Haskell, actually, with a lazy evaluated list. Or you can do that uh, with non-deterministic execution of Prolog, in which you have, again, an infinite number of uh, alternatives uh, pulled out as you go. And uh, because of that, um, I would say that the connection between uh, our mental state and its expression as a programming construct is uh, much closer than if we would go in a step-by-step -step procedural way. Now, what I am uh, still understanding as uh, being a very deep distinction in, in, in what Leslie was saying is that uh, the order constraints that sequences bring versus sets are uh, non-trivial and they uh, need to be removed with a You're muted. Paul, you're muted now. Unmute yourself. Like everybody went muted immediate at the same time. Somebody muted us. A host must have muted us. Paul, you're muted. We can't hear you. I think is someone muting everyone or something. No. He seemed unmuted, but his sound didn't come through. So can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Did you hear anything at all? No. Well, we missed. Just last minute. Uh -huh. I think maybe restate the question. We heard everything except the last minute. Oh, all right. Okay. So, so uh, what I brought in uh, is basically the uh, fact that in uh, some of those uh, uh, lazy evaluated or in other ways higher level languages, uh, infinity is not a problem because it's not actually infinity. It is basically uh, infinity. Um, as a potential uh, uh, construct that, that you would pull out. On the other hand, uh, what I wanted to emphasize, and I think here is where Leslie's uh, deeper uh, insights go, is that uh, we do not have uh, a concept of uh, dealing with arbitrary sets uh, in a way that we make a total abstraction of the first ordering constructs that unfortunately even our lazy evaluation mechanisms bring in. And maybe if you can elaborate on that, that would be uh, uh, very uh, enlightening. Well, although I'm half the Python, I've you know stopped looking at programming languages I don't know 20 years ago or something. So you know it sounds like they're getting, but I can tell you one thing that you might be take something an algorithm Paxos and do a different job of writing it in Python. But that's not going to help Microsoft or Amazon engineers because they're not going to be, you're not going to be able to implement. I mean, the, but the specification of Paxos has message passing is represented by, you put a percentage by simply adding it to a set of all messages that have been sent. And you simply read the message by, I mean, by just basically reading it from that set. Uh, now, you're not going to compile that into uh, some, you know, Amazon uh, uh, cloud system. So uh, if you're not going to compile it, why write it in something that's almost as good as doing it in mathematics? Why not just write it in mathematics? Because mathematics is not necessarily executable, uh, except uh, if and we are neither, computers. But what I'm telling you is neither is your algorithm in, written in Python executable in any practical sense. The engineers are going are gonna, to, it's going to be no easier for the engineers to translate that Python program into C++ is what they'll have to do than it is to translate the TLA plus specification into C++. Eventually, but when, I write it in, <laughs> but when I write it in TLA plus, first of all, you know, I can model check it uh, and I can uh, prove its correctness if I really want to take all the time and energy to do that. But 
it's a lot more feasible than doing it with a Python program. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Bob Kowalski is the next. Yeah. Okay, well, before um, David asked his question, I was going to ask it for him. Uh, but maybe I can elaborate it from my own point of view a little bit. So first of all, I want to um, confess that I think uh, Leslie's idea of algorithm is better than the idea that I proposed some time ago. I, I once suggested that algorithms should be understood as logic plus control. Uh, but I now have been convinced uh, contrarywise that algorithms are, are better understood as uh, state transitions so uh, with the goal either of uh, uh, solving a problem in the final state or, or of uh, simulating some, some world or, or other. But without going into further detail, let me, let me say I, I fully support you on that. Um, and secondly, I, I also support the idea that uh, programming with state transitions as you do can often avoid the need for recursion and uh, give a much more elegant uh, way of um, describing iteration, shall we say, by using universal quantifiers. So with your modal operator, the box, you effectively can, can get the effect by universal quantification of um, what might be a recursion or an iteration in, in another language. <clears throat> so I want to support you on that. Uh, on the other hand, as far as I can tell so far, you, you are missing something, I believe. Uh, which is uh, something that is given in uh, transaction logic, for example. In transaction logic, you can superimpose recursion on top of uh, sequencing of states um, by, by defining paths rather than just individual state transitions. You can have a path uh, and you can define this path recursively. And if you think of this recursive, and you could do quicksort, for example, in um, uh, by, by destructively updating a state in the same way that you do. But instead of restricting yourself to defining individual uh, pairs of, of transitions, you can define paths uh, recursively uh, as one might want to do in, in quicksort. And if, and if you do so, I, I think what's, what's very nice about something like transaction logic is that you end up manipulating your data structure is the state itself. So the, it's a set in other words, and the set that you're manipulating is the state and you can manipulate it recursively. So I'm wondering if you've ever considered uh, say transaction logic in the context of state transitions of the kind that you uh, work on. Well, I don't know uh, transaction logic, so I can't comment on that. <clears throat> but I can give you a, a general, a, a more general answer, is that when I started, you know, people were thinking about programs in terms of behaviors, not in terms of individual, you know, individual states. They were thinking in terms of, you know describing and, and basically behavioral reasoning. And what I discovered is that is, is a bad idea. Basically, the whole, the, what, going back to Floyd, what Floyd did is he got us to stop thinking in terms of the sequence, the behaviors, but thinking in terms of invariance. What is true? at each point in the execution and what is globally true. And what Floyd taught us is that, you know, if you're somewhere in the middle of a program, the, pro the reason that the program is gonna come up with the right answer at the end is not because what happened before, but because of what's in the state, because the state is what determines the entire, uh, Future, you know, the future behavior. The past is history, so you have it, it's irrelevant. And in concurrent algorithms, the most basic idea that, what, that you do not understand a concurrent algorithm unless you understand the invariant that it maintains. A concurrent algorithm is correct because it maintains an invariant. And so you do not want to think in terms of sequences of states, behaviors. You want to think in terms of invariance, what is true in every state. 
And, you know, I can say, you know, you may be able to come up with, you know, some philosophical reasons about oh, why it's great to think in terms of behavior. But I'm talking about you know, 30 years of experience in writing concurrent algorithms. And that is the right way of thinking about them. And yes, I mean, you know, any, any rule like that, I'm sure you'll be able to find, you know, exceptions where something, you know, I can write this thing recursively and it works beautifully in a concurrent algorithm. But uh, in general, uh, it's invariance that's the fundamental concept. And, <clears throat> you know, that's at the heart of algorithms. And that's, that's why it's the state that, that needs to be emphasized. Okay, can I uh, challenge you there? Because uh, when you look at the uh, greatest common denominator problem that, that you talk about in, in the talk we, we, we saw, uh, you, describe, you describe it with a disjunction, um, which relates two states, you know, the, the state uh, of the uh, variables X and Y, both before and after the, the state transition. So, so in what sense is that an invariant? The are you talking about the, the uh, Euclid's algorithm? Yeah, yeah. Why does Euclid's algorithm work? Why does Euclid's algorithm work? What is the fundamental invariant of Euclid's algorithm? Yeah, but the algorithm itself is not an invariant. That that's the point. The point no, is that no. But why is the, what is the reason al Why does the reason that Euclid's algorithm produces the, the GCD? What is the invariant? And I will say, if you cannot tell me that, you do not understand Euclid's algorithm. It's GCD MN equals GCD XY. <laughs> exactly. Let me do a step in XY, that's, that can, stays true. Right? I mean, that's the invariant. Exactly. Under slide. Now, you know, if you're invading the question, if you don't mind also, I'm, I'm, We're but, not talking about, also, I'm not talking about, I didn't, my question was not about proving properties or correctness of an algorithm. My, part, my, my question was about the defining the algorithm itself or what sort of algorithms can you describe in, in, in the approach that you're uh, advocating. It, it's, it's a separate question to, to then show that the algorithms in these languages uh, satisfy some goals or invariants. I mean, that, 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 that's a different point. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I accept that you can you can ignore my question and answer a different question instead, which is fine, but well, you know, maybe but, but, consider my question okay, as well. Okay, okay. well, let me just say, <clears throat> when I, whatever, what I said about not thinking behaviorally, I'm talking about concurrent algorithms. Now, there are lots of things that, you know, work fine for sequential algorithms, where the algorithm, not, algorithms that are that the whole purpose is to take an input and produce an output uh, those you know you can think of those in terms of functions and what you're doing is you're computing a function and thinking functionally you know is very nice in those functional languages you know work great for that uh, but they don't work for concurrency that they, they, they don't provide a oh, Think you do not, you cannot, should not be thinking of a concurrent algorithm, or more precisely, a reactive algorithm. An okay. algorithm that doesn't just compute an answer and stops, but just keeps going forever, interacting with its environment. And that, you know, functions is not a good way of thinking about that. Okay, let me let me interrupt here because the time is up. But we have a we have a whole hour, whole half hour discussion right after two short talks. Okay. But thank you very much. Actually, Peter was in line. And uh, anyway, we, that's why we have the panel with, uh, with Leslie and Richard and, uh, uh, and uh, Patrick uh, just in uh, two, after two short talks. Okay. Uh, also, but that, let's thank. Uh -huh. Okay, go ahead. What, what they, I'll say, I know, I'm happy to answer questions, you know, by email or something. And maybe if we can find some way of doing it online so other people can see it. Uh, I'm always happy to answer questions. <clears throat> okay, yeah, we'll have definitely, I mean, we'll, it's just coming up in a little bit, okay, for Leslie, 